We'll welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library on this very important event. Um, I'm Peter, and I'm very glad to welcome you here. Um, there are restrooms downstairs. There's a guest book to sign so that we can stay in touch with you. Um, we have just celebrated our fifth anniversary, and we're very happy. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very happy to be in a close relationship with the Mullen Archives. Um, and this program this evening is an outgrowth of that relationship and this work. So I'm going to introduce Brian Jong, um, who's a good friend and has been on the board of both the Mullen Archives and the Eastside uh, Freedom Library. Brian. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, and we're very happy to have Dr. Ku Yang, who's the author of the Sayabri Land of the Thousand uh, Million Eleven, and also the Monk Jungle Book, New York. But before I introduce Dr. Ku Yang to the podium, I also would like to introduce Morning Heights and Song Ram, who is the CEO and board of the Mall Archives. And they can come up here and talk a little bit about what the Mall Archives is, and so other people get to know who are the Mall Archives. So, Song and Marlin, would you like to come up here and take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about the Mall Archives and our collections? I would say go back and pick up one of the pink sheets. This is as of the uh, 31st. This one? No, this one is still the November one. 31st of uh, December. We have collected about 206,000 things over our 20 years. Yu Peng Shong at Mong ABC is the one who got us really going. And if he had not brought us together in the uh, summer of 98, we would still talk about collecting stuff. And it would still be in somebody's garage and basement and attic and wherever else they're hiding things. Um, we have been here now over three years and our books are here and down below we have some storage and out back behind we have an annex with more storage. Um, we would be most interested in people's VHS videos and other cassettes and such things. Because now, if the people do not have a way of um, playing them, they might get thrown away. And we would prefer to keep them, because we think of them as being a big, important part of human culture. And then maybe I should be quiet for a little while and let Song talk. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. My name is Song. Um, I was asked or elected to be the CEO of Among Archives. Uh, a couple years ago. Um, due to that, we would like to continue Hmong Archives a big group. Uh, Hmong Archives is a well-known organization. Um, all our staff are much, uh, very much volunteer most of our time. Uh, Marlon is a full-time staff. Um, and so I have, I have been brought in to Hmong Archives uh, when Dr. Brian Schoen had told me about the Hmong Archives. And so um, with my passion with the Hmong culture and all that stuff, I became part of the board member. Um, we were very fortunate that we are part of Eastside Freedom Library, um, that people could come and actually do research and use the materials um, so that, you know, that a lot of people could come here and do research. Um, that's what most of our stuff is mainly for. It's more for research purpose, but we preserve and collect all uh, Hmong culture and Hmong um, heritage uh, in terms of materials to research, to uh, pandao, you know, like Marlon said, the cassette and the video uh, cassette and all that stuff, um, those are things that we collect. Um, and so we preserve um, everything about Hmong for our younger generations and our future generations, and that's the purpose of our of the Hmong archive. We're looking to move it forward in the future, and we, we thought about bringing it to the classroom to, uh, you know, educate younger uh, students about the Hmong archives and why we're doing this, and to also let them know. Um, so we're kind of, in the future, we're probably moving uh, toward education as well, and that's our future goals. And um, But, you know, again, we're very fortunate to be a part of East Side Freedom Library here with Peter. Um, and so we've been here for the last couple of years, and, and it's been open for people to come and do research. Uh, one project we are now working on is 
from Madison, Wisconsin. We had met online a woman who had 500 pieces of Pandao from the 1980s. And we are now getting those things labeled and photographed, and we want to do that as an online uh, exhibit and as a printed book and maybe as a genuine exhibit. And how that will be done, we don't quite know. When there are 670 pieces of embroidery, it is a slow business to get them all sorted and labeled and stitch those labels on the back with the, um, each individual piece. And they are some beauties, some that we have never seen the likes of before. So it's going to be good to get them photographed and out there online. More and more we have got to work about, we've always done this collecting, but we have never really done enough of, um, of getting things on our website so that people would know what we do have and able to come here. The only thing that you can do on the pink sheet, on the information sheet, is to look at the World Cap, to look at our um, local library catalog here, at COPA ESFL, and then we'll see what's, what's here. Did you so, get a lot of online too, or all your archive here by chance? Um, not very much, because I have been developing things, but I haven't finished okay. them. And that means until they get proofread and done one more time, then they will go online. So, <clears throat> um, if you are interested, there is a sheet in the back of the, on the counter about the Mona archives. Thank you. Thank you, Molly and Song. And please come in. There are plenty of chairs. We also have food refreshments, and feel free to grab those. But you know, the Hmong Archives has collected and preserved many of the Hmong items. And even though we collected and preserved as much as we could, but I think the most important thing is the stories. The stories that people often don't tell, or they keep in their mind, and they often don't share yet. So how can we get those stories out? And Dr. Ku Yang is a well-known Hmong professor for the Hmong community who had retired from, uh, from California State, and a professor, so he had wrote many, many books. It is an honor for us, for the Hmong archives in the East Side Freedom Library to have Dr. Ku travel all the way from California here to join us this weekend, or on this special Friday, to read about his book, the Sayyaburi, right? And he talked, in the book, he talked about his experience growing up there, right? And we also had the book in the back, so feel free to purchase the book. Dr. Ku will be here to answer a question and talk about the book too. And you can have his personal signature, or uh, personal message for you when you purchase his book. Now, he also had another book coming up, New York, The Moon Jungle Book, a very, very great book. You know, it's a kid's book, and it have a very beautiful illustration by Yang Kong Wu, who is a graduate student from MCAT. And the book, and the book also designed by Fu Yang, who is around the back here. So Sayyaburi and the Jungle Book is all designed by Fu Yang. We have a team of her publisher, and her which is then for Hmong Educational Resources Publisher. We publish book for Hmong students, K-12, college students, professors, researchers, community members, or just parents that you have story you want to tell. We would love to publish your story because the Hmong archives we collect and preserve, but we know that there are many, many great immigrant stories out there that need to be preserved and recorded into book. And that's why we have the East Side Freedom Library here, a purpose for the immigrant family, okay? So, I won't take too much of your time. So, Dr. Ku Yang, please. To, to interact, you can ask a question. Instead of reading a lot from the, this book and from the other one, I think question and answer will probably be much better. And if you know the story, why I wrote those short story, those books that not me out but from somewhere else, uh, that will probably help you to better understand my work. 
Hi, what's up? Uh, I was born into a very large family, 18 people, multi-generation. So I grew up in such an environment. I was the oldest son, the oldest grandson. So I was trained to be family, the leader of the family, to be the gatekeeper of the community. But I wasn't very good in oral, in Hmong culture, the leader, you have to be very good in oral. You have to also be very good in making basket, use knife, use a crossbow, weapon. I wasn't good in that. I can learn Hmong song very fast, but I never see in my life. I never play sport. So that's my own shortcoming. I was sent to school, partly because of that, and partly because of the war. I remember when I was a little boy, went out to the field with my grandfather at night. He, the, my pig came to eat our corn, so I was with him. A very dark night, I could see the star very clear, so I keep asking him, what's the name of that star? What's the name of that one over there? He kept telling me the name of each one of them. And then I asked him, how big is the moon? He said, what about three mountains? How big is the star? It's about three houses. He didn't have education. He did not know that the moon is closer, but look bigger, but the star might be bigger, which is far away. And then I asked him the wrong question, or right question is, how far from here to the moon? He didn't answer me anymore. He said, I raised many generations, many children. Nobody asked that kind of question. Because in, in, in the Hmong culture, they would ask that. Just like a, a little boy go to the church and ask him, where's God? Something like that. But I was curious, so I keep learning. When I went to school, I asked this kind of question. The teacher loved it. And I loved it too. So I stayed in school. The majority of my classmates in the village drop out, and many join up the, the army, and more than, more than half of them perish in the army. So it's a sad story of that. I also remember when during one of the uh, food offering to the ancestor, Brother Mom we have the new crop, the first thing is offered to the ancestor, remember that offered to the spirit of the land. I was a little naughty boy running in the house. So my grandmother told me, don't be so naughty. Your grandfather called our ancestor to enjoy the first crop. I turn around and look at my grandfather. I can see anybody, only my grandfather. So I turn to my grandmother and said, no, I, just, I didn't see anyone, mom, uh, grandma, only grandfather. So she told me about his ancestor, the spirit of ancestor. They were, you, you cannot see them, but they are part of our family. Tracing back to China, many generations. That's the first time I heard about China. And then when the Chinese come to trade in the village, my father and grandfather both speak Yunnanese. So I learned that it's not too far away. And when I went to school, I looked at the map, but not too far away. And as a result of that, I want to learn a little more about my ancestors, about China. I become the first Hmong American student to study in China in 1986. That's kind of a story one after the other. And I, I also spent two years in the Buddhist temple, partly because my father and my, one of my uncles assassinated during the business trip. So I lost all the support, I stayed in the Buddhist temple. But also before that, I have already learned about a little bit of Buddhism. And in the Buddhist temple, I have no, thing, no TV, no radio. The only thing I have there is any old books, Han, Li, that they record a story of uh, the teaching of Buddha and the story and other story. So I keep reading those. It helped me to, for example, writing this book here, uh, write about Sanyaburi. A lot of this book is in my memory when I was a teenager during that time. And the elder who come to the temple every, every 
couple of days, as they talk to me about story. Every mountain has folk story. Why the mountain has such a name? Why this river has such a name? Why we have this tradition? Why we have that tradition? So I become very curious about those. And those elders also found someone, a young boy who liked to learn, liked to listen to. So I learned those stories from those years. So if you read this book here, you will actually learn about it. It's Sayabui, where I grew up, a hunter. He went to hunt. And then from that first he came, he shot the elephant. The story begins from there. All the way into the town of Sayabui, half of the village name come from this story. And so that's one of, one of the things that I remember. And so people will ask you, well, why you will write those down? Polly is important for me. And in 2002, I went back to visit Sayabori. After more than 30 years away, I went there, found very few people who knew who I am. And I also have a hard time to recognize anyone. Those who are 40 years old and younger had no idea who I am. When I was in the temple, I knew almost everyone in the, in the area. So they didn't know the story, this story. They didn't know about the history of Sayyabui. They didn't know why the name Sayyabui, what does it mean? So I said, I need to put this in writing. Someday, someone will read it, it will be benefit to them. So I began to take a note to refresh my memory and begin to write a little bit here, a little bit there. And I've been back to visit many times. Talk to some of the elderly, so I got a little more the memories come back a little bit later. So I wrote about Sayabui, and that's a story. So to make it a little easier, uh, for those who were born in Sayabui, and even those who born in Sayabui may not know the name Sayabui, what does it mean? or the history of Sayyabui, for example. So I'm going to just say a little bit about this, and then perhaps we can talk a little more about Sayyabui, the territory taken back from Victory, is the only province of Laos totally situated west of the Mekong River. The name Sayyabui can be divided into two parts, Sayya and Buri. Saya is derived from Chaya in Sanskrit, meaning victory. Buri is derived from the Sanskrit word Puri or Pura, meaning city, state, territory. It's the same, uh, same uh, meaning as a Singapore, Bo, Bora, Puri, Chai Puri in, in Indonesia or Saraburi in Thailand. The Buri meaning territory. It has a long history of diverse and rich cultural heritage with fertile agricultural land full of various flora and fauna. Because of this characteristic, almost every mountain cave, natural wonder, and village had its own set of folk story or legend, adding humanity, spirituality, mystery, and supernatural element to this land. The indigenous people of Sayabui, such as Kamu, Pai, and Tong Luang, have lived in this land for at least 10,000 years. And the famous Pratap Siaglong Supa in Sayabui was built more than 700 years ago in, in, indicating that this land has been, has seen many rulers come and go, many civilizations rise and fall, many era of peace, and many periods of war. So a little bit about this, the name, the meaning of that. 
It's not an old name. Sayabui was territory of Yitian Kingdom in 1707, the Lan Kingdom uh, collapsed. It divided into four smaller kingdoms, the kingdom of Luo Prabha, the kingdom of Yitian, the kingdom of Jiang Pasak, and the Kuan kingdom of Xie Kuang. So when the king of Yitian, uh, the Yitian at Jiang Pasak was annexed by Thailand, and in 1828, the king of Yuzhen rebelled. He lost. Thai arrested and captured him and took him to Bangkok. And Thai actually annexed the whole kingdom and Senyaburi included. When the French entered Laos in 1893, only Luang Prabang still exists as a political entity. The rest of them will be Siam, and you look at the map before that, from 19, 1828 to 19, 1893, it's Siam. So the French forced Thailand to return east side of the Mekong River to uh, Lao to the front, but not the west side, same way was in the west side. And part of the was also in the west side, but the royal house of Luang Prabang especially Prince Buddha Kong, the father of Prince Suvanakuma, Prince Pesarat, and uh, Prince uh, Supanu, would work tirelessly to get territory, this territory back. So as a result of that in 1904, Sayyaburi and Jambas, Papa Jambas returned to Laos. But 1941, one year after the German entered Bari, Thailand, claim again, Sayyaburi, Pop Jambasak, part of Cambodia. Fortunately, France was one of the victors of World War II, and they established the United Nations in Taiwan to be a member of the United Nations. And France said, no, unless you return this territory back. So Thai, Thailand, the name Siam was changed to Thailand in 1939. And Thailand really, really want to create an empire for the Thai speaker. And so they, they really want all of those. They have already annexed the Lana Kingdom. They have already annexed the Ayutthaya. And that part, that half of that side. So they do want to get Singapore back. But unfortunately, the French forced Thailand to return Sayaburi back to Laos. And France has a promise independent to Laos. At the time, it's not known such a thing as the Kingdom of Laos. But France, in order to build a kingdom, they had to help Laos to put all these smaller kingdoms into a bigger one and named it the Kingdom of Laos. That was 1946. And the king of Lokobang became the ruler of the Kingdom of Lokobang. And then the king, the first king of the Kingdom of Laos, issued a decree to grant slavery the title of province, the status of province, and named it Sayaburi. That's what we got the name Sayyaburi. It's a new name. So that's a little bit about the history of that. So why it is Sayyaburi relevant to us, the former refugee from Laos, from our places? So I want to read a little bit about the synopsis. Lastly, the book includes the legend and all of the accounts that explain the physical, spiritual order of natural wonder and man-made monuments. This story adds folk culture, beautiful tradition, mysterious belief system, humanistic perspective, 
to the land of million elephants and its diverse people. Why million elephants? When Thai claimed slavery back in 1941, Thai actually uh, named it Chiang Wat Lan San. Chiang Wat is a province. Lan, Lan is a million. San is an elephant. So, believing that Singapore had more elephant than any other province in Thailand or in Laos, even today they still believe that Singapore had more elephants. So they call land a million elephant. They, there is a the book's big mention of people from Singapore who are now living in the United States and other countries. Those living in California include a Paul C. Law, California Superior Court judge, the first one appointed by the governor of California to sit on the bench. Lee Young, superintendent of urban charter school collected in Sacramento. Marlene Cha, U.S. Army Colonel, he is now the only one uh, still active in the, in, in the Army with the rank of Colonel. A, a young law, University of Pacific professor, Peter Bank Lee, dentist, and Susan Lee, a lawyer, and uh, Surya Sak, that's a poet, Sari Tapakhorn, an activist, and Manpeng Lee, Nat Sai Chu, Chamao Mai Si, and so on. See the list of those from Sanyamuri, but live elsewhere, or Johnny Talansi of South Carolina, Bunet Panlak of Florida, Nali Singham of Virginia, Somehon Samon Gao of Canada, and Somun E Chanping Kipsuan of Canada, Kam Pio Wong Yun and Tong Si Van Pilai of New Zealand, and Chao Mani Sakon Panya of France, and I am also from Sanyamuri. So we have many, many refugees here there, from that province. And so that is very us. And I also, in the book, I also talk about Hmong history in Sanyamuri. Uh, my family, for example, uh, I'm the fifth generation. I wasn't born in Sanyamuri, but the rest of my, my, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my uh, great-great-grandfather, all born in Sanyamuri, on both sides of my, my mother's side, my father's side. So we have a long story there. And a little different from the other side in Xian Kuang and Samir because say we have a different unique history. And so a lot of time people think that well, they there's no war in Sabri, but we did suffer our, from the war. Perhaps maybe less than those in the in the border with Vietnam and China, but we do. So I mentioned more history in Sabri, also most involvement during the Second War in Sayaburi and after 1975. So mention very brief that. I think if you let me continue, your public will never stop. Uh, now you learn a little bit, but let me tell you, we'll go back. I didn't have the formal training in English language. When I arrived here in Ireland, I, I, before coming here, I was a student in Laos, so French was the second language. So I, I speak more French and a little bit, not too fluent in French, Thai. And so when I arrived in this country, because of my limited French, uh, very upscale French restaurant in New Orleans hired me as a dishwasher. Okay. So I wash dishes every day, touch water, smell the food. I was 21 years old. I smell the food too much. Hand touch water, my hands really dry. I want a new job. When I come on smell, the smell of food alone really prevent me from having my own dinner. So I said I want to get a new job. A new job means you have to have a language skill, you have to have a vocational skill I didn't have. 
So I said to myself, because I didn't know where to go to look for school. So I wanted to learn by my co washer one work a day. If I can learn one work a day, I figure I should be able to learn 365 vocabulary per day, per year. And with that vocabulary, I should be able to understand. So every day when I come to work, I work with two Kodish washers. It's a very big restaurant. So I say to myself, if I learn from the older dishwasher and practice with a young one, because I was afraid that if I say something wrong, the older one feel offended. So every day I come to work, I have a little, I only had a little notebook like this. And I ask John, the older one, what's this, John? Spoon. Long, loud, French, and Thai, whatever, spoon. What's this color? Yellow. White. So during the break time, I would sit down with Malcolm, the 20 year old with me. So I said, Malcolm gave me a spoon. He said, Well, you learn English. And so I could practice with him. On the way home in the bus, I could look in the way and say, The house is yellow. That girl has white shirt. That car is black. That's how I learned it. It took me a year before I could find myself ESL classes. And as soon I got myself into a, a English classes, and then I moved to Southern California in 1978. So I began study, take regular classes in the community college. And I learned the C minus, D minus, D. I did understand. I want to study, but I didn't do well. I didn't understand the culture. When they talk about sport, pop music, I had no idea. Plus, my English was so poor. But I didn't give up. I could continue, continue. And finally, I got my AA degree. I said, well, continue. And then it, it took me six, seven years to get my bachelor's degree. I was a full-time worker, plus community leader, because I was one of the few people who can speak some English at the time. And then when I go on and get my bachelor's degree, I said, well, I would stop here. And then I stay home, watch TV for half semester. I said, no, I have to go back. I have to do something. Because the negative talk is coming to me. This is it. That's all you, you are. And I say, I, I like to learn. I like to keep the dream going more. I applied to a master's degree in social work. And they look at my transcript and say, no, you didn't have 3.5 GPA like the boy expect you to have. You may not make it. So I make a appointment to see all this committee. And I say, yes, correct. I did do well for four years. Look at the transcript. I did very well last two years. Plus, I have experience in doing social work in this and that, that kind of program, this kind of program. Not only that I will be a student, but I probably will be bringing inside my own experience into the class discussion. So they, they, they like my idea, they took me in, and I finished in three years, full-time workers. And my wife just called me full-time worker, full-time student, part-time husband, part-time father. So I spent a lot of my time in the class. At the time, very few more in, in Fresno. More moved to Fresno. A lot of number, create a lot of crisis, a lot of problem to come behind me out of Los Angeles to come to Fresno as a the troubleshoot. So people call me midnight. Every time they have this problem, husband or wife, children, whatever they call me. And I was young, so I didn't mind to do all of those, and also give me the hope and the power to continue. So I finished my master's degree, and I say the same thing, I know, probably stay home now. But then I read the 1990 US census, more a very young population, newspaper, everywhere, when they talk about more they call the strong age people, many politicians, and local politicians also blame the wrong for having too many children, one article said the average among women have nine children. And then there's another article in Los Angeles Times 
come out and say, a 20-year-old mom married to a 20-year-old man. And I said, no, they didn't bother to come and talk to mom to see the girl. She wasn't seven, not 12 years old, she was a 17. The, the, the age wrong. When the person interviewed her, sent the document to the US Embassy and they make type one typo, you get 10 years older or 10 years younger. Let's say you were born 1960 and they type boom, 1970, you know, 10 years younger. So I said, I got to go back to school to be the storyteller among the story. So I applied to the doctoral program. And they say the same thing to me. Well, I'm not quite sure you will finish the program. You have to have this academic skill. You have to have language skill. You have to have the discipline. You have to have this. So I present myself. I present my idea. Tell them about my own experience. And they listen. They say, OK, we give you one semester conditional. If you do well, we will officially admit you. If you don't do well, you show the way out. And I did that. And I finished. And they officially admitted me. And I finished in three years. So that's my story. Even though I've done those schooling, a lot of writing, I still write an like ESL person. And you will, raise, you will see something I say, even talking, I will say something. Tomorrow I go without this instinct feeling that you, you're wrong gravitably. Uh, I would say, yesterday I come from California. Because the most Asian language that I know, that's how they, they do, Lao, Thai, and Chinese. So that's very easy for me, but it, all of this is possible because many publishers, just like Brian and uh, Pauline to try to read and try to proofread, correct, make it into a readable material. That's, that's so we have yet. This is only some of my, after retirement, let's continue to write. The difference is before retirement, I have to publish what the university has made me to publish. Now I can write, publish what I want. I don't need promotion anymore. I, so I come back to a lot of stories that I collect in the 1980s, in the late 1970. In 1975, when I became a refugee in Thailand, I was so depressed, so everything that I worked so hard for, as in an orphan, stay in a Buddhist temple, stay in a Christian youth hostel, all of those behind me, I went to Lo Prabang, got into the school, got scholarship, but suddenly, the end of the war come. Everything changed. And then in the refugee camp, I become a number. Not me anymore. So to, to survive and to just to keep me healthy, I began to take a note like this again, walk to the elder, learn a little more about story, learn a little more about how the mom tell the story, a little more about their problem. And the more I learn, the more I want to learn. And that keep me alive and healthy. So when I arrived in the US back in 1980, I moved to Southern California. And I began to put those together. And with my own little fund, I save money. I print and make available to children. So today, I still have some of those and my own poem and my own story for children and so on. So I have a lot of poem. Usually when you write poem, you, you feel very depressed and very sad or you're very, very passionate about something, you write better in poetry for my own experience. So most of you are wrong, right? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my poem. Not relevant to this, but perhaps. So I wrote when I was at the refugee camp, I wrote this poem. Follow me. It's about, about how the mom can love one each other, help each other. Very idealistic young man. But I 
there to see things that most young men gone. I'm the first young man I poetry against polygamy. And my friend said, well, one of your maternal uncle had two wives. One of your, two of your maternal uncle has more than one wife. I said, somebody have to be the first one to say something. And I said, I didn't mean against my uncle. And I did. And, and so I right into the social problem among drug, opium, addiction, uh, gender issue, and the poverty in the refugee camp, as well as in our society. So I put a lot of those. So little, that, that's just uh, some of my experience. So you have some ideas about why I collect the story, why that was important to me and not for other young men. So that's, it's moving to, for example, the story about New York, the Hmong jungle book. Some of those also my interest about Hmong story. When I heard story about Cinderella, I said, we have that too. When I heard story about uh, the Julia and Romeo, I said, we have the story too in our language. If you want to go to Rome, Provence, they should break the mountain, girls' mountain and boys' mountain. They died out of their love for each other. Same with Julia and Romeo. So if you go to those territories, Rome, Provence, Henry, take my book with you. Why this mountain has such a name? Why the story about a boy and a girl? And that's, you know, part of me that I visit. When I visit Laos or my other mom, I travel along the Ho Chi Minh Trail because I know the story of the war, which battle, where, and why. So I would love to see places like Pupati in San Lua. I know the story. I saw the, I grew up in Siabri as well as the Long Prabha, the palace, the temple. When Obama visited Mat Chien Tong and some People translate Mat Chien Tong as a golden temple. I say, no, 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 non golden temple. Chien Tong is the name of the kingdom, the, the Luang Prabang, before the capital was moved to Vientiane. So they, the temple was built when the capital of Lan San was Luang Prabang. So they named Chien Tong, for example. So a lot of this story, even today, not too many people there know this story. And that's probably even motivated me further to connect, to write down. Because I'm the one probably feel young men who learned this thing when I was there. So I want to stop here and uh, see if you have any questions for me. If you want me to read more, I will do, but Any question? In Hmong, in, in the language? Lao? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just a personal question. How many children do you have? And do they still live in California or what are they doing? I have four children. My son, only one son, he is in Georgia. And I have three girls in California. And my wife and I live in Central California. And uh, if you, you probably heard, if you know me, you heard that I was a very risk taker. And also, I'm not so traditional. I break a lot of tradition in Hmong culture. I never had the bailout, for example. When Hmong asked me, I said, no, it's not required. It's a tradition. And actually, I say to a lot of time, last year I come here, I also make a, a, do a, a speech related to Chinese policy of the one bell, one road. And some people ask me, I say, maybe we are the, the, the enemy, the biggest enemy of us. The monks say, do as follow your grandmother, follow the the path of your grandmother, follow the way of your grandfather. I say, that type of us, that put us in the box. We need to think beyond that. 
So I was one of those who said, it as it changed. But take the best of what you are among. At the same time, you will take, learn from other people. That's what I am. I learned from a lot of other ethnic groups in China. Um, I'm probably a critic of China more than anyone else, but at the same time, I also learn a lot from them and break the tradition. Uh, my wife is a Chinese. By the time I was ready to get married, most of them look at me, take a look and say, he's too old. Not now, in my time, if you're 25 years old, you're too old. If you're 25 years old, your uncle take you to look for a wife, the girl is 15. She was a pop music. You talk about Socrates, you talk about Confucius. They nothing connect each other. So, as just such, many of us may have to learn more because of tradition. But one thing I do give the tradition, not tradition, the, the Yap clan do not eat animals hard. It was a curse. So I, I respect that. I never, I never tried because it was a curse. Plus, generation after generation, I don't do that. But I never have bail law, for example. I can tell people, in California, you change your name, people have different idea. You change your gender, you change your name in California. So I, I don't. Plus, when people will know you, you change your name. So I don't. Um, <clears throat> almost all of the escape stories are uh -huh. going across the Mekong, getting to Nong Kai, Pak Chung, other places. What was it like to actually go across the land border through the mountains of Sayabori? And how many people did that? Because almost everybody seemed to go down towards Vientiane and Pak San and, and get over into, into Thailand. Also, Initially, many went to Vietnam because that can follow the, the route to the capital and cross the river much easier. But later on, Sayabri was one of the major passage to Thailand. Even people from Sequan, from, from far away, it took them many months to cross from where they are to the Mekong River. You heard a lot of story about people drowned. You heard story about Parents put opium to the children so they can they can sleep and, and will not cry. A lot of story of people die along the way. It's land. Uh, and the people in Rover Mountain Sayabri, most of them cross through Sayabri territory to Thailand. And I did the same. I was a student in Rover Mount. So the friend of mine, I did plan to leave the country. I was worked so hard and hoped that I would finish school and continue my education in France. So I did not want. Plus, the coming of peace. I was a young man, very idealistic. I sounds beautiful. The prince, red prince, he was so ele elegant about addressing some issue. And it's peace, equality, uh, prosperity, all this term, uh, independence, was so beautiful. When was the first time in the country like Laos, anyone would talk about equality among the people of the country, the ethnic group, the prince addressed that. But he did not have the power to implement it. Once the party behind was more powerful, so by December 2nd, when they actually proclaimed the Lao People Democratic Republic, the prince was out of power. And, and so during the struggle, some of us was want to stay, but eventually everything changed and changed. I went back to school and the school was closed without any day of open again. I heard this friend laugh, that friend laugh. Uh, Classmate of mine took me to Lomorov, his motorcycle would roll around the Puma. And then he told me, he said, Adieu, it's the French word, he just said, Adieu, see you in heaven, in God's hand. 
That means permanent goodbye. So you know what does that mean? We need ask because the more you ask, the more problem you might have. And the, the other people should say the same. So we know that you will go. I can ask because you, I know that you're going to go to the exam and happy that the internal gave me I have to give information. But if I don't ask you, I don't know. And so a lot of change at the time in life. Left with a friend, took a, took a motorcycle from Rome about this area and walked to Thailand. Yes. But also, how do you know when you actually have crossed the border? That's mountains and language is kind of the same on both sides? And, um, similar. Yeah. Very similar, but then also people who leave the border, they come and have some idea. There's no mark. But when they say you go to this village when you are in Thailand, you go to this village when you are in Laos. So when you walk into Thailand, you can see culture will be a little bit different than the village. The people in the border of Laos and Savory, Savory and Thailand, they belong to the ancient kingdom of Lana. So the Lao script in the palm, uh, palm lip. It's actually in the Lana kingdom language. So they understand each other. But you also can detect the accent as in this different territory. Anyone else? They had to deal with the larger committee, they will, they, they will come to me. When I attend feasting, for example, they didn't know whether they invite me to sit with the elder or let me sit with the younger group. They did not know what to do because you don't have wine, you don't have bailout. It took a long, long, long time for them to actually accept you, the new one. So that is you know, the story. What I can tell. For my student and other monk is never give up. I have D, D minus. All of those continue, stay on, stay on. And one day, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So don't, don't give up. Even when I was desperate, and my father, I, met my, I told you that my, I was born a very big family. When one of my, my youngest uncle was killed in the war, my father and my uncle, this non-smoking, non-drinking, did the love trade, and on one of the trees, they was assassinated. So when they alive, this just maybe sell one or two pigs, maybe one ox, they can support me in school, but now they're gone. So I have to stay in the temple. In the temple, that means that you eat leftover of the monk. So some people call them dog of the temple. But the temple was great for me. It's peaceful. Nobody say me bad language. And I can read whatever I like to read there. I can study. And the monk was very supportive of me. So I survived. I still today, if I told my wife whenever I have to stop at feeling uncomfortable indigestion or other, I say that's the when I was in a temple 
no food, and no food to eat the full food to have to catch now. But poverty, I made poverty as a temporary. Never accept poverty as permanent. And poverty, as a social worker, we don't see poverty as a lack of money. Poverty is a lack of power to change your social good, economic condition. Why? You, when you see the picture of poverty, if I ask you to list a picture of people poor, you never list a student. You always list homeless, welfare people. But students, some students have less money than some welfare recipient. But students have the power. They're working to change the social economic condition. And they got a degree, they're going to get a job, they can move on. So when you are poor, lack of power means you accept it. And that's very difficult. As a social worker, I have to see family, middle class American walk in the welfare system as a family. They stayed up for three years and they cannot get out anymore. So when I was a social worker in the Fresno County, one of the tasks I try to do is to get our people fast as can, get out of the welfare system. It's like the tiger. I often tell my mom people, you take a tiger from the jungle, very independent, very proud, self-sufficient, take him to the zoo, you feed three times a day for three years, and you release the tiger to back to the jungle. What happened? Die. So the longer you stay in the welfare system, the harder to get out. And that's the thing that we work with to empower them, to think that they can change. It's not you. If I tell them to change, it's different for them. But if they want to change, if they want to go to school, they want to do, they will do it. And most students do. When I talk to parents, parents say, we do this, we, we force them, we do all things to make them study. I said, no. They have to know what's in it for them. When they know what's in it for them, then they will study then they will work for it. If you can have more children like this kind, maybe one of them say, I want to be author. One of them say, I want to get a master's degree. If they have that dream, if they know what they need for them to get a degree, to get the job, to do that, they will do it. Yes? ก็ไอ้เดี๋ยวโซยาเนี่ยเป็นอะไรมั้งเพื่อนท่านท่านเลยเอ่อจะสปอร์ตก็คนใดก็ก็จอดเอาไปลงมองไล่ไปนะซึ
Agent Orange, even though the majority of spread along HTML, or Jimmy Trail inside South Vietnam, but also part of South Vietnam also hit by Agent Orange too. So I address those issues. And I feel that it's, it's our moral social responsibility to address some of these issues. And as I said, right now, actually, it, it's, it is the U.S. acknowledge about that in Laos, too. So you can find uh, my other books. Uh, for example, this one, this is what I want not to read. The Making of Mount America. And you can get this from the easier basis. Go to Amazon book, type my name. So all the book that I contribute to also show. I also wrote a lot about Laos and the people in Laos. Um, how they contribute to the making of new modern Laos and the war. The, the many Hmong talk about the war like they're only one side. The Hmong was actually divided into two camps. So I keep telling them all, if you talk about the Civil War, American Civil War, you only talk about one side, then you miss the whole picture. It's like if this hand. If I had to talk about right here, I had to come at me. So we need to talk about both sides. Right or wrong, that's not my job. My job is to do research and to present what happened in, 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 in from my own research, no more know about communism, capitalism. Even my university graduate student, they cannot define communism, capitalism. Very few can do that. During the war, the only thing they come to you with a gun, and they say, are you with us or with the enemy? What do you got to say? You have to say you're with me. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to make you an enemy right there. <laughs> and that's what sometimes your family will separate. I have family on the other side that we never acknowledge publicly. In 1995, I got a telephone call from now, and exactly who he is. He knows exactly who I am. Need no introduction. The war separates us. And, and so I have known relative and say, agree. When I went back in 2002, he came to me and said, you remember? When you were small, your grandfather came to visit us. We talk about we're going to move to get, stay in the same village. Then the war came, and we never dared to tell the story. And that's that's the war that we need to learn. The secret war is the one of the secret, mysterious part of Hmong experience that Hmong often don't have the good idea. I even heard Mo say, oh, we, we uh, got the whole human trail. The whole human trail was way down in the region 3, region 4. What they talk about is road 6 and road 7. That's a sequel and some there. So, example. So, I wrote a lot. You can get some of those maybe to your liking. Some of those maybe uh, it's a different. It's a different version of history. Anyone else? Yes. Still pretty involved with the Hmong community. Uh, yes. With the Hmong community. I still serve as a board, in the, in the board of directors of some local Hmong organization. Uh, George Polo and I were served together in a, a, a Hmong American organization in USA. We raised funds to provide scholarship to young, young Hmong. Nobody else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
We didn't have telephone at the time. We don't have any moon. Boy and girl were really separated, say, at night, just look at the moon. I will also look at the moon, so our eye will meet each other there. If the wind blow from my side, see if you can smell my scent, I will do the same. And I used to tell my student, in our time, they only take they only take shower once a year during the New Year's. So we we do have sense. So there are different generations now. You have a cell phone. My generation just look at the moon so they feel the air, the wind. It's very emotion. It's a heart 
not physical. And so that's a lot of this is now I try to put together for the next generation. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I have too much to read. If I keep continuing, you will never have a chance to go home. Uh, if you want to read any other work that I have, just type my name. Uh, I have a business card here, and you can take with you. Some of my business card actually have a title, and I have some of my work that published in Chinese. Uh, and you, if you can read Chinese, you can also read those as well. Um, so that's my ending here, and thank you for coming and support. And thank you, Brian, Marlene, and her publication that make this book a beautiful piece, even though still like ESL language there. English is actually my fifth language, and Chinese is my sixth language. So I don't already speak any language very well. My mom is my mother tongue, but it's no formal training. A lot of terms you cannot write in scientific language. My Lao, I left Lao only four years, four years ago. I was a very good Lao, actually. I built a temple. That's why I can translate the same way in the name, and you can divide it how many part of the term. But after 40 plus years, I didn't use language. But I went to Lao, I speak Lao, people look at me. You speak ancient Lao. <laughs> and, and I also have to very careful think about what this term, what that term. Many new terms that I don't know. Cell phone, for example, I don't know. And I have to relearn a lot of political terms that I don't know. And so English, after 40 plus years in this country, I still, just like an ESL speaker. So I, I never have any strong language. So when people say, wait until you're very good to do it, I say, no. Write when you want to write. And someone else will make it better. Long time ago, an elder Chinese tried to let level a hill. And a young Chinese came and looked at him with big Uncle, what did you try to do? I tried to level this hill. And the young man said, Uncle, you're already really old. You think you're going to finish? And the old man said, if I stop now, you and my children are going to finish it. So that's all my dream. It may not be very good in English, may not be very good, but next generation can be make better. My generation, the other thing I learned about history is, long time ago, we come from China. That's it. I make a 12 trip to China. I visit the monk almost everywhere in China. I did find out where my ancestors come from exactly. So I hope someday they read about Senior Bree, they will say, ah, that's what our oh, ancestors come from. The read of our Lord Rama, the read of our Sien Kuang, they will say, that's what our ancestors come from. And that's why when I write in, in, in English, I will put a Chinese name there, I will put a Lao name there, so one day they can take it, even they cannot pronounce it Lao, they will say, where this village, where this town, and I hope they can find that. So thank you very much. <laughs>